This podcast includes explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to a new episode from the Earth Days podcast. Today, we're asking ourselves what it means to be a man in the 21st century. Is masculinity in crisis? Is it okay to talk about feelings? Can being less of a man improve your sex and relationships? We discuss this and more with fellow podcaster Ben Bidwell, also known as The Naked Professor, and with Josh Schollmeyer, founder and editor-in-chief of Mel Magazine, a men's magazine with new horizons and a love of dicks. Today, it's raining men. Hallelujah! The Earth Days Podcast. Okay, everyone, we're going to dedicate first base today to our favorite men. I would like to hear from you. Who are your favorite male fiction characters? For me, it's definitely Phil from Modern Family. It's just, it's his childlike sense of wonder that just brings joy and playfulness to every day. And he's such a flawed character as well. Every time he tries to be more masculine by repairing the house or something, he just kind of fails. But then you see that his true strength lies in getting people to talk to each other about their feelings and keeping everyone together. I just love him. I admire him. Oh, that's a good one. Great role model. What about you, Lena? I have to say I had a super hard time thinking about what male fiction character I'm into because I usually focus on the feminine characters. I think that my favorite male fiction character, it has to be like a cartoon. I thought about this anime called Ranma and a half. Ranma one half. Oh my God. It's about like this guy like in ancient China that whenever like he gets like soaked in water, he becomes a woman. <laughs> I think that you found a way of cheating the question. <laughs> What about you, Pandora? I think I'll go for Chandler Bing from Friends. Just like, you know, classic boy. <laughs> really. really, you know, cla- yeah, comic relief. Classic boy has a really lovely friendship with Joey. He's really terrible with uh, talking about how he feels. And then he starts dating Monica. And then he has his catharsis. Again, cheating. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but... Then he, like, really grows up in the season to become, like, this really nice guy who ends up being really funny funny as well yeah otherwise I just like that I was gonna go for the godfathers <laughs> the godfather. <laughs> but I think that would be just too much <laughs> well at least it's not Scarface or <laughs> I don't know I like bad boys I also had a hard time deciding but I think I'm gonna go with Morpheus from Matrix because he's such a masculine figure but at the same time such a motherly one he's got the pills and the dream you know he's a dream former all right so now that we're with our favorites men let's go straight to the main course the question of today ladies is is masculinity really in crisis in order to be able to answer that question, I think we have to start by asking ourselves, what is masculinity? You know, the Cambridge Dictionary uh, defines masculinity as the characteristics that are traditionally thought to be typical of or suitable for a man. What do you reckon? How would you describe those characteristics? Some of the characteristics will maybe include being quite strong, confident, successful, dominating, competitive, in aggressive ways, not a good listener, violent, sexually aggressive, predator. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sexually aggressive doesn't mean like straight up like rapist. It can be also like in more subtle ways, like like this, for example, idea of like men always have to have the initiative, how like accepted it is, and yeah, like in softer ways, but still like somehow there's like the component of aggression and the goal of like, being a womanizer right but then again all of these are kind of negative characteristics i think there's also a positive side about the figure of the provider for the family right the one who take, takes responsibility and needs to take care of others but not in a mother way but in a out there in the world fighting way <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think and there's some of the, the strength and the confidence and everything to sort of make decisions and be concrete and problem solving which i think can sometimes be a bit confusing because especially for women who don't always want their problems to be solved they just want someone to listen to them but it is kind of helpful also to have someone around doing those things for me masculinity is like so good and then so bad at so many things i don't think my father was a really good masculine man he made a lot of bad decisions that he didn't take accountability before that my mother would take for instead and that was just makes me skewed about how i feel about masculinity in a negative way whether i like like it or not sometimes i'm just judgmental towards men when they make a decision i'm like mm. <laughs> <laughs> i think that's an, often like in the household there is that cliche sort of situation where you get the 
the fun dad stepping into the situation and the mom has to make all of the boring, nagging, sensible decisions. But sometimes the decisions weren't even fun. They're just like... But it's just like this bit that the father's the father figure, it's the material provider, whereas the female or motherly figure, it's like the home and emotional labor. De- labor. And then that's like the home. Absolutely. And it's interesting how, you know, we've come from fictional characters to our fathers, <laughs> which I think is like, you know, we look at all these references that we have for describing or understanding masculinity and they're limited. They're so limited, I think. And that is, I mean, it brings us to the point that obviously masculinity is a constructed social gender, right? And away from like the, you know, sexual or biologist uh, definitions of it. And I think it's, that's why it's so important to have different references and to creative references. And that's something that is happening now, though. Like, as we've seen, I think in the last five years, we've seen, like, so many more proposals of different characters, both female and male, in, like, mass media. That's really good, because in so many ways, it's just pretty much, like, dismantling the myth that because you were either born with a penis or a vagina, you are supposed to display very specific, like, very narrow traits. I think it's just, in so many ways, it's just, like, insulting to our humanity. We're, like, far more complex than blue or pink and emotional or aggressive you know it's like we can be all of it absolutely and the thing is there's such new horizons like opening up when you stop thinking on those categories remember the shoot from earth days not so long ago about the male virgin oh yeah yes <laughs> i thought it was such a fascinating example of how a person was not meeting the you know expected standards of a man because he hadn't had penetrative sex in his life and he was like you know already 30 and it was so interesting to listen to his experiences and then see him, you know, losing his virginity, so to say, for the first time. You haven't watched that shit, have you? I have watched like a bit of it. And it's what I like the best about it. It's that the sex is actually so good. I guess that it's also because of all like this bullshit we uh, built about the concept of virginity, which virginity altogether is bullshit. But anyway, (laughs) that's like the the, the funny part. Like if you are like an experience or you are a virgin, it's like this idea of like, oh yeah, I'm going to like stick it like three times and then I'm just going to come and then just like (laughs) won't be able to do anything. But then the way in which like the whole like episode develops and so on, it's really cool, really like sensual. You see the chemistry and it's like oh my god this is really hot and it's really amazing because it pretty much takes down the myth of what it is to be first of all a virgin or what it is that you are missing or not by not having your sex life center on penetrative sex Absolutely, yeah. So to our listeners out there, if you want to go and watch this shoot or many other more, just go to erstis-podcast.com slash erstis, that's E-R-S-T-I-E-S. Follow the link and get 50% off your first month. This is an exclusive offer from the Erstis podcast to Erstis. And please notice content is 18 plus. <laughs> So basically these whole ideas around masculinity are bad for everyone, right? Men and women and everyone else involved. Um, I think if we look a little bit of, at the statistics, the American Psychology Association brought out the numbers that men commit 90% of homicides in the United States, and they represent 77% of homicide victims. They're the demographic group most at risk of being victimized by violent crime, and they are 3.5 times more likely than women to die by suicide. Isn't that crazy numbers? Like, I didn't know about this it's interesting how you know women will get told like not to get out in the night alone because it's so dangerous but i mean actually men are clearly the victims of violent crime and they're very often confronted with huge violence i used to be addicted to um those true crime shows and they were talking about like top 10 like number number one serial killers and they actually stated that women were like yeah one out of 10 which makes sense with your statistics women that do commit crime were purely emotive Whereas the other nine out of 10 men were like very vastly, some were emotive, some just came out of repression, like, you know, from their mother, maybe having problems with their mother and it came out in a different way. And that's because I feel like women talk more about their problems and men don't. That's what I was thinking when I was watching it. Yeah. And that's why like this was released by the Psychological Association. So it was actually 
advice for therapists to be aware that some of the masculine traits are actually leading to this kind of stuff and to maybe treat that like especially but what was interesting is when it came out it just created kind of a war on social media with reactions like of men feeling attacked and being like you know you're just attacking sort of my masculinity oh no what, like, what, what was the argument like I mean the, the, the facts are there yeah so what to do like well when you attack a man's masculinity they're gonna react in a, an aggressive way well that's the thing I think if you're not you know if you're not open to vulnerability and expressing feelings and you are sort of depending on violence to express things then you're like that is you that's making up your personality that's all you have so you mean like they felt emasculated because the conclusion of the study was that men were over aggressive because they cannot speak about their feelings so they got offended that well they were like yeah that men were over aggressive and it was leading to this kind of that masculine traits that they you know hold dear or look up to were actually leading to this but then it's like that there's not enough awareness of an alternative so it's kind of saying oh you can't be any of the things that make you a man so it's like saying you can't be you uh we need to approach the situation differently then yeah (laughs) then throwing statistics at well, yeah, situation, it's, like, it's pretty much just like throws the, the light of how massive the problem is of traditional definitions of masculinity and what it is to be a man. Yeah, and I think it is the first step to first analyze that, right? And then you have to find solutions or different yeah. approaches. And I think there are currently a lot of examples of analysis of like what is masculinity also re- relating to those like figures on, on, on mental health challenges and depression and suicide. You know, we watched together the film The Mask You Live In by the Representation Project, which was, I think, quite an interesting uh, overview of like, yeah, how not talking about your feelings and repressing them and just having only violence or aggression as an outlet. Or alcohol and drugs. Or alcohol and drugs. That yeah. was a big one as well. And that was interesting how much work one can do with, uh, especially with youth, right? Or how important it is to start with the little boys or teenage times to open up and to talk to these people so that they find other ways of dealing with their emotions. Yeah, and some of my gay sort of male friends are super aware of this and coming home from school and having had a fight or like someone trying to provoke a fight or bullying them and they're like both mothers and fathers saying fight back. And I don't think that's something that we should necessarily blame or be too mad at parents for because they've lived through that too and they just want the best for their child. They're afraid that they're going to be pushed down this sort of social hierarchy if they don't prove themselves to be tough. I guess if your mom comes home, if they are also, like you said, your friends are gay and the parents yeah. don't understand it's how concern. they feel. They don't understand. So they give you the worst solution, which has no yeah. merit. It's crazy because masculinity gets defined as the opposite of femininity, right? Yeah. So that's like... Don't I mean, be a sissy. Don't be a girl. Man up. Act like a man. Yeah. Not so, as a woman. Exactly. So I think a big step in this is sort of not looking upon feminine traits in a negative way. <laughs> and I think that's where media plays such a big role to find like references of, you know, alternatives in media. And nowadays, you know, we have such an overload of media since Netflix and all of that. I think that is super interesting how that can have an impact on so many people. Did you watch the you like commercial this year, by the way? Oh, you the showed best me. It was a man can get. <laughs> I actually cried. <laughs> that's not unusual. But the fact that you were having a conversation, I mean, the fact yeah, that, you know, such a commercial would like open up those conversations within families and friends it divided audiences the whole Gillette thing (laughs) I mean Gillette were happy with the outcome and they still sold enough products and whatnot but it was a dip I believe from what they were expecting or how they've performed so far but it's super interesting because it's a they are a company that's been advertising so far really traditional like masculine you get it in the same like shaving adverts perfume cologne adverts watch adverts car adverts (laughs) so for them to talk about an aspect of masculinity that isn't just like a physical or a material trait is super interesting but I think some people still felt like they were being pigeonholed into a certain role or being preached to. Not which, all men or yeah. what? But as a marketing plan, that was absolute gold, I have to say. Like, well done to let yeah, people <laughs> talking. Exactly. 
But what else besides commercials? I was spending some time to watch Justin Baldoni. Baldini? Baldini. <laughs> the hot guy from James Virgin. Yeah, basically the hot guy. <laughs> he the hot guy, and he d- he did like a mini TV series called Man Enough, and you can find it on YouTube. And they're like half an hour, and mm-hmm. it has the guy from uh, Orange Is New Black actor. It has an Israeli comedian. I'm so sorry, I don't remember any of their names. And then there's also Hamilton, the lead uh, the lead actor for the play Hamilton. And they all sit around, they have dinner, and they talk about like mass masculinity and they talk about vulnerability and it was super interesting and I was reading all the comments and they're all like from girlfriends saying I've just sent this to my boyfriend and like blah 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 and like even a few men were like thank you for opening it up but it only has 50,000 views well I guess it takes time but yeah. I think it's it's super interesting I haven't seen the series but I saw his uh, TED talk yeah. and it's uh, one of the parts that I found the most interesting was like that bit where he says that sometimes like uh, whenever like he speaks about I don't know like typical like male stuff like training and that and like he's like meal plan whatever people are like oh like praising him and so on and then when he chooses to talk about emotional issues and so on or relationships or like showing the emotional side like he's like pretty much first of all like received with skepticism but then like shortly after that like people like start to reach out to him so it's not that he's gonna like get like instantly like super attention but even if like he reaches out to like a smaller audience that reach and that impact it's significant and it also like says a lot about like having like spaces for people who identify as men to discuss these issues whereas like elsewhere they rarely exist there seems to be such an emphasis on masculinity talk on physical traits like sports or being strong and i guess if you're not able to talk about feelings you're kind of only left with that right there's so much to gain for them also i think uh we had an interview with our first unicorn of the day ben bitwell also known as a naked professor and he was telling us how much his life has changed and how much happier he is since he started questioning his own thoughts on masculinity this is what he told us So shall we start off by talking about the Naked Professors? What is it all about and how did it begin? Oh, how it began is actually quite interesting because I was on a flight to Ibiza to a friend's wedding and Matt, who's my co-host, was on the same flight, going to the same wedding, but we'd never met. And then the universe delivered and we, we had, there was only two seats, one of the rows of the, the plane and we sat next to each other. And I was looking to record a podcast and I recorded it with him. And then so something was saying to me, don't release this yet. It's not quite right. And a few months later, Matt and I came together again. It's like, actually, should we, should we do this together? Like every time we get together, we have a conversation that, you know, we should record really. Let's, let's do this together. And the Naked Professor, I'm, I'm, my blog name is the Naked Professor. And then the Naked Professor became the Naked Professors. And um, yeah, our vision was very much to try and get influential people or heroes, um, celebrities who have this perceived sort of idyllic life and try and get them to share that actually they face challenges and that, you know, life isn't always easy. And no matter who you are, we all have mental health challenges. We all have difficulties and we want to share their stories and and try and get vulnerable with them and try and get them to uh, empower our audience by allowing our audience to hear that no one's perfect. Everyone's got difficulties. That's what we've done. And we, we bracket it under the mental health because I think everything that we do, you know, all the lifestyle choices we make, it all affects our mental health. And fundamentally for us, life is about how you feel. It's not about how it looks. And this perception that you're creating of your life, it's actually you're the one who's got to live with how you feel. So let's talk about that. And I think it, it just it hits a bit of a unique spot because we're two men and there aren't many men talking about this stuff. And, and Matt and I are very happy to go vulnerable and be open and, and talk about emotions and feelings. Yeah, it just creates a bit of a sort of a new dialogue, I guess. I think it's a really good philosophy. And I was listening to your podcast just recently and I really don't hear that many conversations between men like that at all. So thank you. So let's get more into the masculinity topic. What does masculinity mean for you? I don't know, like I'll, I'll share instinctively and what, what comes up for me is it's just being real, whether you're a man or a woman, it's, there are different energies inside of us. You know, the male energy is different to the female and just being real and not denying that kindness that I think we've all got inside of us, that compassionate side, man or woman, that the desire and ability to love. It's that side of it that I think the men have really lost because I think growing up, I thought being a man was purely about being tough, strong, brave, you know, getting the girls 
perhaps even treating the girls badly, being great at sport, being physically strong and, and like impressive looking. You know, that was what I thought was, was a man. And alongside that, love, compassion, kindness, empathy, connection, none of that stuff really fits in with the other side of masculinity I was talking about. Where I'm coming from, and I think where Matt's coming from, is two, these two don't, don't need to remain exclusive. You know, we're not saying, you know, men shouldn't go and chop the wood or go to the gym or do the activity. You know, I have the banter and all that stuff. It's part of it. But it doesn't have to be exclusive. Exclusive. It doesn't mean you, you can't, you know, show your wife love, you know, love your kids, be kind to your friends sometimes, you know, be compassionate, listen, not always just kind of take the piss out of them and never show weakness and never be vulnerable to say I'm not perfect. It's that complete lack of willingness to be seen as, as weak at all in any aspect that I think cuts us off a little bit from our truth and who we really are. So that for me is, is yeah, is, is masculinity. There's two sides to it. There's definitely the macho side, you know, go and be the leader, go and be that, you know, that man, if you like, but don't forget that emotions count too and, and feelings and being kind and all the stuff that I mentioned, you know, that's part of being a man as well. You're saying, you know, you did grow up with this idea of cliche of masculinity and was there, was there a moment or was there something in your life that did open up for you to your other side? Like, was there, is there a, you know, before and after something that happened that maybe helped you connect with that other side of masculinity? Um, yeah, it was really working with a coach. I worked with a female coach, actually, not intentionally. It's just she, she came into my life and, and it felt right to be with her. But um, my body talked to me sexually. You know, I, I think for, for a lot of people, kind of a, a sense of emptiness or depression or anxiety can come up for different reasons. For me, my body talked to me by sort of shutting myself off sexually. I didn't feel and, and I always struggled to orgasm. And that was kind of my thing. That was my cue. Like, I, I, I didn't want that in my life at 30. I was like, I want to have a wife and family and a sexually fulfilling relationship. And I don't need any kind of barriers. There's enough barriers. It's hard enough as it is anyway. So then um, when a coach came into my life, I was, I was still pretty shut off to, to growth and personal development and kind of that other side of masculinity. I was pretty much stuck in that space of being tough and strong and whatever. But just working with her, having that desire to want to work with someone to help me sexually. We didn't talk about sex at all. She just unwired my, my mind. She unwired my my brain and, and got me to start embracing vulnerability and um, suddenly I started to see changes in myself and, and better connections and better relationships suddenly I could tell my mum that I loved her you know and, and things like that mattered to me hugely yeah all came from my from my body talking to me sexually if it wasn't for that I think I would be in that same space and I'd still have a sense of emptiness so I'm grateful now to my body for talking to me and, and I'm grateful to myself for listening can you talk any more about the connection between sex and mental health so for me, I, I think it's a pretty unexplored area. You know, I've seen loads of different people and no one's got the answers and everyone's got different philosophy and theory. And, you know, I'm going to explore Tantra, which will no doubt I think will help me and, and I'll learn more from that. But my connection between it is that from a young age, as early as I remember, I was I learned to not feel. Um, it didn't help me. I had two older brothers and I think my natural reaction growing up as the youngest was to get this sense of um, kind of, I want to say being bullied. And I probably took it quite personally. And for them, it was playful. But... My way of coping with that was just to stop feeling. I didn't want to feel that sadness. I didn't want to feel like I was less value. I didn't want to feel like they were more important. I didn't want to feel the pain of, you know, some phys things physically when we played sports together and things like that. So I just, I think I learned to shut myself off. Just don't feel. I've always lived in a bit of a box, you know, and I don't have mass massive highs and I didn't have, have massive lows. I didn't really feel anything. I was never hugely joyful. You know, I can link that in directly for me sexually. You know, sex, you know, it's a feeling of ecstasy. It's like euphoria. And if you're just not feeling, that feeling is probably not going to be as powerful. And you, you can't just choose to feel some things and not feel others. You either feel everything or you don't. And that's why it's important to have the, you know, we're going to have the down days and the high days. It's natural. But yeah, I just wasn't feeling. And I think my body became a bit numb. That's something I'm still working on. I'm still trying to re-energize or on a mission to keep feeling more and more and more. Cool. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Are there any concrete like exercises or anything that you've experienced that has helped you to actually work on, on that, like through sexual uh, experiments maybe? I've worked with sex coaches and, and urologists and psychotherapists and all sorts. And there hasn't been anything that's been like, oh, this feels... You know, but through my own, I guess, my own learnings as a, as a coach, what I'm really now working on for me, like I've learned the power of our mind and how much, 
you know, our thoughts play an impact. So I, I've had to really rewire and change the way I think, how I see myself sexually. So I am now really trying to visualize a lot more and visualize what I want to happen rather than staying in my thoughts of keep regurgitating what's happened in the past. Same thing, same thing, same thing. It's actually now trying to see it differently and try and get my body to experience something that or see something, see an experience that it doesn't, it's not used to. I, our body doesn't know the difference or sorry, our mind doesn't know the difference between perceived events and, and real life events. So things it's actually experienced and things that you imagine. So for me, I'm trying to imagine this stuff. So my body starts to think this is how it behaves. This is how it's real. And I, I feel that is going to be the, the key to my to the change for me. But this is deep rooted. I'm 37 and we're talking 20 year, nearly 20 years of the same experience or similar experiences. So it's deep rooted and it takes a lot of work and you can't just think of something once and your your subconscious has changed. You know, this is an ongoing, long-term process that I've got to keep working on. But that for me is a big part, trying to get my mind on side to, get to to visualize what I want to happen, not what has happened in the past. Can you explain that more? What, what do those regurgitated thoughts from the past sort of look or sound like in comparison to maybe like this more embodied experience? You know, my mind will regurgitate evidence of the events that I've had where I just, I wouldn't orgasm. It would just be this process, you know, that's what, how it would pan out. So I try and visualize myself actually of having this really powerful orgasm. Do you think that, like, aside from this kind of, like, personal growth issues, that some of the issues that maybe you had experiencing orgasm are coming more from society-driven factors, like pressure to be dominant during sex or pressure to come and that's sort of coming from outside of you a bit more. Like the conversation that we're having right now about tantra and energy is quite unusual, I think, in sort of masculine discussions about sex, right? There tends to be a bit more dominant. I definitely think growing up, yeah, you, you as a man, it's a big mark of your manliness, isn't it? What the girl says about your performance. Definitely. I probably wasn't as present as I could have been in sex because I was thinking about, you know, trying to impress. And if you're trying to impress, you lose yourself a little bit, don't you? So I think definitely I was guilty of that. Absolutely. And that probably comes from a place of lack of self-love or self-esteem, whatever you call it, where you're not confident enough in yourself. You have to impress everybody. So it's all about the show. But in doing that, you're not necessarily yourself. That's definitely something I try and embrace now is, is, is the vulnerability that this is me. Like maybe we won't have the best sex you've ever had, but this is my, this is me and this is how I express myself. And rather than trying to conform to be the best, I think the best experience actually will be in a way if I'm my authentic self and they see my authenticity and my way and they get that sense that I'm, I'm being true. Do you think that peer pressure plays quite a big role in some of these perhaps more negative aspects of masculinity anyway? Definitely, yeah. Comparison is a thief of joy. For yeah. starters, you know, I really would say that. Yeah, it definitely goes back to, to what we said before. There is a pressure as, as a, like, you know, how you perform in the bedroom is is, is a big part of your masculinity, I think. It's a pretty big compliment, put it that way. If word gets around that a guy's a stallion in bed and he can go for ages and he can do this and he can do that and, you know, wow. It's funny that yeah. men care about each other in that way. <laughs> it's a definite part of our masculinity, I think, how, how you're perceived sexually. Have your friendship groups sort of changed as you've gone on this journey or have you found you've had to maybe distance yourself from certain people? Yeah, I'd say they have changed a bit, to be honest, but I think the ones that matter are still there. You know, the ones that are based on actual real connection, who are curious about me, who, who you know, and vice versa, that there's a depth to it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's really liberating when you get to a point where you don't need everyone to like you. It's like, hey, this is me. I'm going to connect with better with some people than other people. And I'd rather show up and get a great connection with, with some of you. And other people go, what the hell are you on about? You, you, you're not my cup of tea at all. And, and that's fine. We don't need to disrespect each other. But have a proper connection with people who really do see you. I, I was the opposite. You know, in my 20s, people didn't like me. It hurt. I lost myself because I, I was trying not to um, to be someone that someone wouldn't, wouldn't like. That That's not authentic. No one really sees you when you live in that space. If you're trying to live not, not to offend who are you? Mm -hmm. You're just a, a basic level of yourself. And that was me, I think. Yeah, you can't be everyone's darling, can you? <laughs> no, it's not healthy. It's not possible. No. Often when these discussions come around masculinity, especially like in the internet, for example, you know, Twitter and all social media, uh, there are some negative reactions from men. They're feeling attacked maybe, or, you know, this whole like not all men, or why do you think this happens and how are you dealing with it? Or what do you think that can be done? Uh, how I deal with it is I, I try, I'm trying to fit into between two spaces. For me, we're not telling men to stop being men. You know, this, this isn't an attack, like embrace all that masculine side that, that's there, that you feel represents you as part of your identity. 
keep going with that. But uh, but we're kind of saying that there is also another part that I think we're missing and that, that it's kind of an addition into our life alongside the identity they've already got. And that side of being vulnerable and being open and willing to share emotions and talk and get deeper connections beneath the surface, that actually can take you into a, a far healthier state of mind for me. When you're burying all this stuff, you d- I, didn't, I didn't feel alive. You know, I was ticking boxes, but I didn't feel alive. Um, I was ticking masculine boxes and being a man, but and there was a, a sense of emptiness. So where I'm coming from is trying to mediate these two worlds. Um, just because you're emotional and open and connected to your feelings and very loving and compassionate doesn't mean you're not a man. I'm wondering if there's anything you've learned from your experience with coaching or your conversations with other guys that they find to be quite approachable or encouraging in terms of opening up to emotions. What's a good starting point? I mean, like awareness is the first stage of change. So, so it's got to start with, with education and awareness. And, and I find that there are more men now coming to me saying, this is tough, but, and I tick all the boxes, but I still, I do feel a bit empty. Can, can you help? And then having education around why embracing emotions is, is a powerful thing. Why it's bad to bury emotions? What does it bring? Why is it a better way of living with emotions in your life? The way psychology works, it's people don't tend to do things because they don't want something. Like I, they won't make a change because I really don't want that. It's they'll, they'll make a change because they really do want something. I really want that. So rather than saying you're wrong, how you are is not good for you. It's like if we do some work and you, you can get some of this stuff, then that can be really powerful for you and change your life. And you can start to feel more alive. You can feel an energy and get a deeper connection in your relationships. You can start to show up and do things with passion without fear of failure. And all these opportunities can come alive in your life. But it's kind of, you know, empowering them from that psychological perspective of let's go get these things rather than you're wrong. Move away from this space because actually that space has been comfortable for them all their life and it's kept them alive and their mind is going to say stay here that's how our mind works it's not an easy there's no quick fix solution you know everyone says yeah but just tell me how to do it I'll, you know I'll, I'll do it tomorrow and it's like <laughs> our mind is a stubborn thing it's, it's we're gonna have to grind this out and we're gonna have to do things out of our comfort zone and we're gonna have to you know work hard at it it's not going to be easy and it's going to mm-hmm. take time it's worth it it's absolutely worth it also, we wanted to ask, since you've been embracing vulnerability more, how has it impacted or changed your romantic relationship? Are there any situations or conversations that may be like specific ones that you've handled differently because of that? Yeah, well, I'm single. So um, I have been for a year and a half now. My last relationship was kind of a, an entry, I think, into, into vulnerability for me. I started, you know, I was more vulnerable than I have been before, but I think I've changed a lot more in the last year and a half. And I'm really excited about the future and connecting with girls at a different level. Now, in terms of dating life and, and trying to connect with people is that, you know, I am very confident just to show up and being me. And that's not going to be for everybody. And that's great. You know, in the old days, my 20s, I'd want all, every girl to fancy me. You know, and if they didn't, it was like, well, that's, you know, but actually I'm not, I'm not perfect or whatever. Now it's like, hey, I'd rather make one amazing connection in a hundred and only for one girl to fancy me and for us to have an amazingly powerful, authentic re- connection and relationship and for all the 99 others to think, absolutely not, he is weird, not my cup of tea. That's my goal now is just to show up authentically. This is me and then I'll find the right connection with someone. In the meantime, if, you know, if, if I, if I'm attracted to someone and they're not into me, that's no problem. Like I'm, I'm, that's, that's great that we're not, we're not right for each other. That's so healthy and sounds so great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank Big you. thumbs up for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a much better way of being for me. I'm, I'm much happier. This is vulnerability is embracing rejection. If it happens, it's no problem, but it starts with self-love. You have to love yourself and then you can be vulnerable. Then you'll start to have really meaningful relationships. I think that was such an interesting and such an important point that Ben did about feeling good with yourself and then learning to accept rejection. I think that's such a, an issue. For, I mean, especially now with all the rise of thousands of dating apps, mm-hmm. how men would behave in these platforms. Uh, what is your experience? It's intense. You just literally, all you do is you say hi, you have a little chat and then you don't respond for like a day or something. And then you're immediately met with abuse. Um, there's actually, have you seen that Instagram account by Felipe? No. It just includes some examples of these things. I'll read some. So a guy messages a girl, hi, I want to suck my dick. No, you're a bitch. 
And that's quite an extreme example. It's probably not a good conversation starter to begin with. But even I've had reactions like that just from not replying quick enough. It gets in straight into you're a bitch, you're a whore, you, you know, you're just teasing me. This terrible, extreme reaction. And I don't know, it's just why is there such a crazy reaction to being rejected or not getting exactly what you feel you deserve in that situation? Yeah, the entitlement is your key right they think they deserve to be answered and answered in their own terms so anything that doesn't fit that projection is so distressing for them in person it's terrible like if i'm at a bar and they're like i'm like oh they come on to you and they're like i'm just not interested they're like why i need to know why you're not interested am i not good enough for you and it's like no i'm just having a drink and i'm not in the mood to fuck anyone today <laughs> especially with your attitude Yeah, I think people shouldn't have that expectation. Not everybody is going to like you. You're not going to like everybody. It doesn't make you less of a person. For me, it's such an extreme emotional reaction. It is. I mean, it comes like also back to the part of entitlement because, I mean, if you take this attitude to like a super, super massive extreme, then you have like insults. Then you have like all these like super like radical right wing. This sort of like masculinity has just like sold the idea to men that they are the kings that are here to rule the world. But the moment you challenge that, it just like it's far more frail, you know, than what you are told when you are like uh, of what it is like to be to be a woman. And I don't know, when it comes to rejection, there's even like some programs that actually like teach you how to deal with it and how to. And it also comes like with like emotions, what it's okay to do, what it's not okay to do and how to manage that. And it also taps into the emotions. Exactly. The thing is, everyone's dealing with lots of emotions when they're going on dating apps. It's scary and you're putting yourself out there and you want something. It's difficult for everybody. So, of course, we're all afraid and can easily get hurt in that situation. But if your reaction to getting hurt is to immediately try and hurt somebody else, Mm -hmm. and that's at the dating stage, what happens when that moves on to a relationship stage? Yeah. It's even worse. Same thing, usually. And it's also, (laughs) and it's, it's, even more dangerous because it then it gets masked with the bullshit about like romantic love so it's not about a dude like being aggressive and stalking you you for example you remember that youtube video about like this poor jerk that like played the piano for i don't know how many days straight to gave back like his ex-girlfriend <laughs> I yeah. hate those representation in movies. movies. Yeah, and <laughs> everyone was like, oh my god, he's such a hero, he's so romantic, blah blah blah. He is a fucking asshole. She said, no, leave her alone. That's like proper like stalking. And then it's just like sugar coated with like romantic bullshit. And in the end, like people like hit him or something, he got punched in the face or something. <laughs> Fortunately. But those are like even like the romantic streams. And I think it gets like even more dangerous because it's not like the straight up aggression it's more like manipulative stuff and then they were uh, everyone's like oh my god he's a good boy like he loves you so much but he's like insisting 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 it's such a medieval idea of romantic love and platonic love right i dated some non-conventional masculine men and i remember telling them like at the end after a few dates i was like look i'm really sorry when i'm not really feeling like we're very compatible and they took it so wonderfully they were like it's totally fine i really hope that we can just stay friends and i get very angry anxious when they say can we stay friends i'm always like okay are you taking this rejection okay because you don't really believe it i don't really believe it because i'm still scarred from trauma you know like trauma comes back and they ended up being very good friends of mine because they understood that it's okay that we're not compatible move on next person you know like and they didn't take it as a personal attack yeah absolutely because I was just like look I just don't think we're compatible and he was like that's totally fine and he was very non-conventionally masculine he talked told me how he feels all the time he always wanted to be make sure that like I was okay before like if we were to make a decision we make it together and if I wasn't making a decision he would wait until we both spoke about it in in retrospect I should have never broken that up (laughs) (laughs) But I had, like, I have had some good experiences with these kind of, like, I do believe that there is, like, this really wonderful wave coming through of non 
conventional masculine men. I agree, and that's a really good point. I think there are a lot of people wanting to escape, though, exactly for the same reasons. They are also suffering under all this pressure and these expectations. So the problem is there's no tools. I hear it so often lately. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know how to act. What am I supposed to say? How am I supposed to deal with these situations? And I think it's important sometimes to just bring it down from this, like, stress. Some some things are really simple, and we're just not used to them. For example, the other day, I, I went to have an interview, and when I came in, the guy that was in the interview asked me, do you want to drink something? Do you want tea? Do you want coffee? Do you want water? I'm like, oh, I'll have some water. Thank you. That's fine. Very normal situation. And later we we're talking exactly about these topics. And he came to say like, oh, it's so tricky now when you're with a woman, like you don't know what she wants. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? And I was like, well, when I just came here this morning, you asked me what I wanted to drink. Was that awkward? Was that very complex? Was that a horrible, frustrating situation? No, you just asked me what I wanted to drink and I told you that's fine. So it's actually the same. Like, just ask. We're just so afraid of asking, of having that conversation. That's a, like what we need to learn. And if you think if you compare it with other situations in life, it's so simple. Ask and right. listen and like try to make it past your own insecurities. Yeah. And like, when it comes to, like, to dating and relationships, we all, both sides of the spectrum, outside of the spectrum, whatever it is that you locate yourself or identify yourself, like we all need to learn how to date, how to have relationships, how to develop like healthy patterns and how to confront insecurities, emotions and all like this sort of like biases that come with our ideas about being masculine or feminine. I think things can be easier and I think it's very important also to take it with humor, you know, be able to laugh about yourself. No, like... you're a whole idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that was an Another thing from that Instagram, some guy had messaged a woman, nine inches, think you can take it? And she was just like, I don't know. I never dated anyone 67 inches shorter than me. <laughs> I think, yeah, you, the humor thing is important, but like, we are coming to a point where if the women are always the ones trying to deal with the emotional stuff and like we're dealing with these messages, we're making the jokes, we're trying to initiate these conversations and things. It would be nice if everyone plays a part in that. And I really agree with Pandora as well, that if those conversations maybe take on more of the level of talking about the dynamic between you rather than a personal attack on either side. I think that makes that conversation so much easier to have. And as Lena said, it's a pattern. So we need to relearn this. Like we have to keep reprogram. An amazing example of a magazine that is approaching all of these topics from a male's perspective, but still with humor, self-irony and curiosity, especially is Mel Magazine. I think that we've all became big fans of it, haven't we? <laughs> big fans. Yes. It was so amazing to have the opportunity to talk to Josh Schollmeyer, the one of the founders and editor-in-chief. How are you, Josh? Hi, Josh. I'm pretty good. How are you guys? We're good. Exciting to be talking to you. I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me. We want to know how did it all start with Mel Magazine? So I was working in more traditional men's publishing at a little publication called Playboy for about five years. And I was really taken with the early mission of Playboy from the 1950s and 60s, primarily around social sexual values and what was then the Playboy Forum. And they had things like Crusader Rabbit, where they bankrolled a whole legal fund to bail out people people who'd been in prison for blowjobs and anal sex and, you know, freedom of speech stuff uh, against the death penalty. And I thought that the brand had a lot to offer in a much more kind of 21st century way using, you know, online media more, you know, too much of what I thought the the brand and, and not just Playboy, but all of the kind of competitors in the men's lifestyle space were all sort of obsessed with these consumer goods and this kind of bullshit that like, if I didn't match my jacket to my socks, no one would ever love me. Like if I wasn't driving the right car, like my children would never come home again. And I just felt like it was really false. It didn't represent sort of what was going on in my life. Certainly, I think about things like some of the more consumer style, fashion, cars, all that kind of crap that they normally shove down your throat. But I, I thought about it for like 3% of my time, you know, and the other 97% was much more dedicated to, you know, at the time I was in my mid 30s and I was starting to think about like different stuff, uh, pr primarily around, you know, my physical health. M mental health is a big thing for us. We talk a lot about trying to triangulate three aspects of life. I don't think this is just for men, but you know, like I am super, super ambitious. You know, I wanted to break the internet and men's publishing, but at the same time, you know, I'm married. I have two kids. I love my kids. I love my wife. I want to be a very active partner in all of that. I don't want to, you know, I remember my dad once telling me that he had never changed a diaper and I was like, kind of, kind of an asshole, dude. Like, how do you, I'm not quite sure how that would have ever flown at, at my house. And then the third thing I think is your own personal identity. You know, I don't want to be known as just 
just dad or the guy who dies at my desk. Like I, I want to have like my own thing, my own life, my own interests. And it always bums me out around Christmas time when everybody like gives me two presents. It's like either rum or like I'm from Chicago, like a Chicago Cubs hat, like as though I have like no other interests in life. And so, you know, I was thinking a lot about that stuff and I was thinking, and I'm worrying about money, but I was just kind of like questioning money and, and all that stuff. I think that too many of those other lifestyle publications are way more into like the single guy and like pickup artistry and all that kind of stuff. And I was much more interested in however you define monogamy relate, you know, whether you're poly or monogamous, like I was just interested in relationships and, and not necessarily trying to figure out how to have sex or seduce the woman who was on the cover of a magazine, but like, how do I have better and more sex with the people that I, that I want to, I thought that there was a real space in the marketplace for that. I was really kind of jealous on here in the, in the States on the, on the women's side of things with Jezebel and the cut and broadly later and the hairpin at the time. And I thought that they were doing a much better job of one merging what's great about the internet, which was great. And what was great about print in terms of voice and sensibility, but also just doing a much better job of charting, not just feminism, but what it was like to truly be a woman in the 21st century. And I didn't think that men's publishing, again, I felt like very old school, you know, before I stop rambling, I'll tell you one last, so when I was at Playboy, I had to write like three stories about axes. And I was like, what the fuck do I do with an ax? Like, I don't know what to do with this ax. What am I supposed to write about it? And my editor at the time is like, no, cool guys hang axes on the wall to their house or their apartment. And I was like, I don't think that that's true. I mean, I don't, I've never seen one ax. Like I'm from the Midwest. Like the axes I've seen are like somebody's shed, like cutting firewood. Again, it was super false. I mean, it's even a little even naive at this point now, post Trump and post me too, of what we were really trying to do. But I just felt like people weren't speaking to kind of, even me, I worked in that world. Like I didn't feel like it was speaking to me in any real way. And I, I thought that masculinity, I mean, certainly the change, this was five years ago. So the, you know, four and a half, five years ago. So I thought that there was more happening there. I, I don't think even I understood exactly what was happening and even just the kind of fundamental social change and shifts that we've seen over the last five years. But I definitely felt like it wasn't talking about anything honestly. You sort of wanted to find something that you would be more interested in. Do you think that that relates specifically now to maybe a millennial audience or it's actually men everywhere? And I mean, I've always said that, you know, in the early days, I used to joke when people would ask me what Mel is. I used to say it was me working through some shit. I mean, like I'm like a 40 now I'm a 40 year old male white male <laughs> straight like the world really doesn't have a lot of use for me anymore or interest and I just wanted to kind of and I didn't want to like take attention I just wanted to sort through like what was my new place in the world I thought that men are sort of in this existential crises and I think they're going one of two ways at least here in, in the US you know they're either sort of like when men were men and we wanted to go back to all this stuff or I think there are guys like me who want to participate in kind of this fundamental shift that society is going through but don't always know how to don't always say or do the right thing and I think now you live in a world with cancel culture and call out culture especially on Twitter where it makes guys even more nervous and I don't want to be boohoo dudes but I, I do think that people that want to participate sometimes don't know exactly how to you know I wanted to have kind of a very messy conversation about that existential crisis I didn't want it to be again there's no playbook for how to be a guy right I didn't I don't want to pretend I had all the answers I wanted to be super curious about it I wanted to dive into all the different dudes that I thought were doing interesting shit. Like I'm a true voyeur at heart, right? I don't necessarily always want to do everything that I read or see, but I definitely want to get a front row seat and see it up close and see what parts of it might speak to me. And I, you know, that's what we try to do is, to, is talk to men who are living interesting lives and thinking about all this stuff in a really kind of compelling way and, and hope that people get something from that and not shove sort of lessons down their throat. Yeah, I think it's so amazing that you do it also with kind of like, a, you know, a definitely a lot of humor, but also like self irony, you know, refreshing. Well, I appreciate it. You can never take yourself too seriously. I will say that some days when I walk to my car after work, I'm like, what the fuck are we doing? Like, how does this make any sense? Like, you know, we do like a big me too piece, but then the next to it is like, guys don't know how to wipe their asses. <laughs> and like, it's like, how, how does this fit together? And it's really, the New York times wrote a really nice thing about us. And, and the fast company did like kind of a big profile of it. I find it very rewarding that people understand how it all fits together because in my head, it makes a lot of sense and I don't take myself too seriously. I think you're always an asshole when you take yourself way too seriously. We just try to remain curious. You know, I thought last year, even at times we got a little self-righteous and I think that that's kind of the worst sin is like acting as though, you know, everything I just think is a really shitty way to be. And 
I'm a big believer in as long as it's not hurting another human being, like whatever the fuck you have to do to get through the day, like do it. Life is very challenging, you know, and it can be a challenge like minute to minute, hour to hour. So I don't know why I would ever judge anybody for doing what they did. Again, as long, so long as they're not sort of like hurting another person or living. I think the curiosity thing is a really good attitude to have. It's so infectious on your website as well. Like I was watching her reading articles earlier. She's just like, oh my God, what is that? I want to know. I need to it's really an intriguing site. There's really intriguing information on there. So I think the curiosity thing is definitely working. I'm wondering what what's the response from your readers? Like, what's the feedback? I guess it's been changing. I'll say a couple of things. One, when I started the site, I knew what men were talking about privately and thinking about, and I wanted to kind of pull it out of them, right? And I remember in the early days, a lot of guys I knew would be like, every time I go to your site, I feel very seen. And I was like, well, that's kind of the point. Like, I want to I wanna put some of this stuff out there. And that really worked. I think when Me Too, or not even Me Too, when Harvey Weinstein happened, ensuing six months after that, I feel very strongly now that all of it is out on the table in really kind of gnarly ways uh, and uncomfortable ways. And I'm no choir boy. I, like I worked at Playboy. That stuff was shocking even to me, you know, a, a lot of it. Again, maybe I'm a Pollyanna, maybe I'm not. But I feel now the important part is men have to put this thing back together. Like we broke it, we bought it, right? So I feel like it's important from men of all walks of life. You asked about age. Like I do think we have a wide demographic, probably younger Gen Xers and older millennials. I would say somewhere like 28 to 42. And I think all sexual orientations, races, cultures, religions, I think all of us guys have to get together in that group and be like, all right, what are we going to do about this? Because it's real fucked up and there's nowhere to hide. Right. And it's making all of us look real fucking bad. And how do we where do we go from here? And I think the thing I hear now a lot from readers is they feel whether it's that stuff or kind of the more silly stuff that they feel like there's actually a publication out there for the guys in their life that they know. I hear that a lot. That's actually the most flattering thing that people have told me about it, that like, you know, it feels like this is representative of the men in their life, as opposed to this archetypal guy who doesn't really exist or is only performative, you know? And I think that that's the thing we try to do too. I think that Me Too has shown that a lot of quote unquote allies are actually rapist shitheads and like the bad guy is actually the wolf in sheep's clothing, you know? And, and I, we're doing a whole special thing on the the nice guy. And the whole notion of that is the nice guy is usually a dickwad, you know, and I don't profess to be nice. I don't profess to be woke. I don't, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out. And I think, I think people find that refreshing. That's, you know, that's what I hear a lot. And again, very realistic, like real. Yeah, I agree. And I guess I love it. <laughs> well, how would you define the masculinity for yourself or what does it mean to you? Well, I have an interesting, I mean, so I'm, my family's been in this country since like the 1870s and I'm really one of the first ones to go to college. So I grew up in a, like a very working class Chicago Midwestern kind of thing. Like I love my mother, like I have very strong female role models and even the male role models in my life, they were not like football and I played sports and I love all that stuff. But I mean, they, you know, they also like I did theater and I did like writing and like they were always really supportive of kind of like whatever I wanted. And I've just always been somebody who kind of fits in with a lot of different groups of people. Like I just, I don't, felt like I ever had like a predetermined like masculinity. I definitely am tough. Like, I mean, I'm tough because I've seen sort of my family work in the trades and what it does to their bodies. And, you know, I, certainly what I do for a living is far easier. So I'm not going to complain if I have to pull 12 or 14 hour days. I'm definitely tough on people. Like, I feel like you can sit and you can talk about a lot of stuff. And I think that's great. But I also think at some point you need to, you know, make a decision <laughs> about, you know, how are you going to handle the situation? And I think you have to be decisive and I think you have to you know trust in your instincts and stuff like that but I don't I feel really lucky that I don't feel like I was sort of pre-programmed to have any kind of masculinity I think it's why I'm kind of open-minded to change and this is what's kind of unfortunate about all the Harvey Weinstein me too stuff is like in fairness I think a lot more men are on the side of wanting to change participate in all of this than not I think the problem is the bad players are really bad you know I've done some really awful shit and and, you know, we're all complicit in it, right? Like, you know, I worked at Playboy, like 
I'm complicit. I'm doing penance. Like, you know, I tried to give the playmates that I worked with and I think they would tell you to a woman like a ton of agency and that they really liked working with me and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I was still the one calling the shots and it was reflective of my desires. And and, and I don't know if I could have told you that when I was there in my early 30s, like even at that age, I totally got it. And I don't think you ever really get it. But we talk about this a lot around privilege and some of the stuff that you hear about. I think the biggest thing is like, you've just got to consistently ask yourself those questions, I think. And as long as you're interrogating it, I think it's fine. But it's the people who kind of put their head in the sand and, and don't want to interrogate it that I think are probably the, the most, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate because I think you do start to see the world differently when you're open minded. So just the fact I mean, that we're having this conversation, yeah. I feel like, like I'm already seeing this as so positive. Just the fact that we're talking about it and trying together to figure out how do we deal with this, right? And yeah, and my thing is just, again, messiness, right? Like, and I, I think that when the Harvey Weinstein stuff happened, we were a pretty new publication. I didn't really know how to talk about it. Alana Levinson, who's my deputy editor, and I both tried to write like kind of like a blind op-ed and we're really struggling. And she called me up when the shitty men media list came out and she was like, you know what? The women on this site are tired of carrying your water. Like you've got to figure this out. The men on this site have to figure this out. And I think that was totally fair. And Miles Klee, who's kind of sort of an extension of me in a lot of ways, I, you know, we talked for like 45 minutes the next morning about what do we want to say about this? And we talked about how, you you know, this is a revolution and, and do you want to participate in the revolution? <laughs> and if not, you're going to get steamrolled by it. We can all agree on that. And he wrote this beautiful piece. I got very curious then. And then like sort of we did tons of Me Too stories, <laughs> tons and some of them that I regret. Well, I don't really regret, but I, I was, you know, I was curious. I wanted to know sort of as much as I could. And then at the end of the year, kind of punctuating that, I let Alana write a big piece about what it was like to be a woman to work at a men's publication during Me Too. You know, she dragged us and it was fair. We did not react well in the moment. I think we all felt shitty about everything that was happening. I think we felt shitty about not knowing what to say. But I love that messiness. When you ask about like what has helped this public, I think it's that level of messiness and honesty. I don't see GQ doing that. You know, <laughs> I don't see Esquire doing that. You know, and again, some of it's a competitive advantage, right? Like they have a legacy. It would, be, it would be hard even at Playboy, I think, to have, even though I got away with a lot of stuff and was able to really push the envelope, I don't think they would have been open to really grappling with this stuff in public. I'm lucky in the sense that I'm new. I'm developing an audience. I'm trying to find my own, our own voice. There's a competitive advantage there. But at the same time, I feel like it connects with people. And I hate using us, the media. This is why people hate the media as some sort of prism with which to look at regular people's lives because that's bullshit. But I thought in this case, it was actually a really interesting, like we were, there were some very, we have a morning meeting every morning at 930. There were some very, very, very tense meetings. Many of the men here will tell you they didn't want to go to those for months because it was uncomfortable. And it wasn't just Weinstein. After that, it was Louis C.K. And that was Kevin Spacey. And now it's gotten to the point where we don't cover it, a lot of that stuff, because like, what else is there to say? Like these guys are total shitheads. Uh, we have said so much about this and I want to start focusing again on, on more constructive dialogue moving forward, right? Like how do we sift through the remains of this, whether you want to call it toxic masculinity or whatever you want to, like men are not in a good place. And like, we have hurt a lot of people and I haven't, you know, like I don't feel personally responsible, but I feel like we should be having that conversation. And if you don't have the conversation, you can't lead it or you can't be a part of it. Right. It, that's what I worry about more than anything is like, I'd like to be a part of this conversation. So it's got to be messy for now. I don't have anything poetic or articulate to tell you about it. Like I haven't learned any great lessons. <laughs> like it's kind of still me going through a lot of shit, you know? So you were talking before about like alternative ways of relationships, right? You were talking about like questioning monogamy and figuring out different ways of living and creating family maybe. How much does that play a role in both in the magazine and in your personal life? I've always been a big believer in you try everything once. <laughs> so <laughs> that's... Uh, to, yeah, why not? <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable with. And two, when it comes to interpersonal relationships and, and sex, as long as both parties are consenting, I have no problem whatsoever with what anybody wants to do. I think that the biggest problem with that stuff is communication. I think that people who have bad sex lives, it's not about because they want a specific act or they want to have other people involved or but it's because they can't talk to each other about 
what they want and their desires. Or they can talk about it, but somebody's you know threshold is lower than, than the other. And yeah, you can go so far and, and then you have to find a happy medium and if you're going to be truly happy. But in the same way that I feel like passion for career is important to life, me personally, I feel very strongly that, you know, sex and, and love are very, very important sort of fundamental parts of life. I don't see why also at the same time as I get older, like why I should shut my libido off or not want to continue to go down the path of trying everything once. I feel much more comfortable now than I ever did before, you know, especially in terms of communicating my needs, desires, interests, et cetera, et cetera. And I, that takes a while to get there. I think you got to try a lot of different stuff uh, to see what works for you with a lot of different people. And I don't think anybody should ever be castigated for that, even if it involves like working with sex workers to help work through some of that. stuff. So I, I don't know why we're even still hung up on this stuff in 2019. You know, I mean, it's, to me, it's kind of crazy that we're hung up on any of this. I, f I feel like in the 10 years or so that I've been covering this kind of stuff, I, f I feel like we've made huge strides. Like, the, I mean, there wasn't even gay marriage here in the U.S. <laughs> until four or five years ago. So I feel like it's really changing. I think, again, you can change all the laws you want and you can be as open minded as you want. I do think communication with your partner or partners is probably the most important thing. And I don't think we do a good job here in the U.S. in terms of how do you educate people around that? Not about sex acts or the, the gravity of them in terms of pregnancy or STIs, but like, you know, how do you navigate love? How do you navigate conversations around sex uh, for things that you would like to experience? And how do you, to agency and ownership, how does it not become just about your own desire on either side, right? We've made huge strides. I think there's still a ways to go in large part because it is sort of the amorphous, like you've got to just find somebody that you can talk to about this stuff, you know, meaning whomever I think you're in a relationship with. Yeah, I think the, um, the whole sort of emotional conversation thing, I'm wondering if you think that's going to, in good communication, the responsibility for initiating that or upholding that, do you think that's going to become a bit more equal? I don't know, in my experience, I feel like it's often put more <laughs> on the women. <laughs> do they? you have that conversation? <laughs> yeah, and it seems if we're having, if you have groups of male friends that maybe don't talk to each other about that kind of thing, then of like almost, of course, it gets put in that realm. Well, I definitely think dudes have a problem when women are really honest about what they want. I mean, we just did a whole thing about like asking six women about their like deepest desires because we don't understand female sexuality. Men, especially, I don't think understand it, right? What well, was surprising surprising to me is, I mean, this was intense stuff. It was like, I want to be gang banged at Burning Man. I want to blah, 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 blah. And I think maybe the part of the communication to get it out of the gendered space necessarily is what's challenging probably for men right now to understand is like on one hand in the public sphere, you're hearing all of this stuff, you know, treat women, you know, blah, 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 blah. And in the private sphere, what they're hearing is I want you to choke me. Um, you know, I want to do X, Y, and Z. And I think, I think trying to figure out how that all all fits together is is challenging for men again not to be woe is us or by any means but I, I think you're hearing two almost completely different things right and how do you square that you know when I was 22 I probably wasn't capable of understanding some of that stuff and figuring out what it said about me you know it's so nar it's always about you so it's like what does this mean about me and so I think those are are very complicated conversations yeah and it's not really it shouldn't really be incumbent upon a woman to be like I have not needs because I I think it's past the point of orgasm but but like you know i have desires i have interests i have things yeah and i think it's interesting that it feels to me strange that you would publish an article like that because they're really keen to know these answers to them they're too afraid to ask the woman yeah. those questions i feel like that maybe or they're afraid to hear the answer right. they might not be afraid to ask i wonder if that comes into another one of the stereotypes of having to be sort of like dominating so then you sort of skip over any of those things possibly coming up we're also going like zero to 60 right so you have a world where my mom's like you know be a tough guy and then like pegging is a thing so like how do you go from like again you know this That's the thing you can do yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but you've got to figure that out you know what i mean for yourself so i think that article really made me think a lot i'm trying to ruminate on this like public sphere v private sphere thing because yeah again like how do you ask plays like a huge thing now for dudes but how does the narrative become how do you flip the script which i think we're doing but there's a lot of deep programming i think that has to happen <laughs> there you know again because i think there are half of men who 
still are fine with the way the world is. And those are still people that love their moms and <laughs> love their daughters and want the best for them. But I think, you know, aren't really thinking that rigorously or hard about this. Life is hard, right? So I, not everybody gets to sit around and think about this stuff all day like I, like I do. But I am really kind of compelled by two seemingly very disparate conversations going on and trying to find a middle ground there. We're well, both thinking ass. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask anything, one of my proudest achievements is I brought Analingus to the straight community. And when I was at Playboy, I did the first big ass eating story that straights were eating ass now, too. And I'm very, very proud that, that like seven that. years later that I have. So I will talk about this endlessly. I, I, New York Magazine gave me credit, Gawker. You know, whatever I can do. <laughs> yeah, and we noticed that you had Ask Week at uh, Mel Magazine recently. Yeah, for Valentine's Day. I mean, what else are you going to do for Valentine's Day other than Ask Week? Which we actually proved that everybody is from that original article, Aiden Ass. So how do you see you know, the next 10 years in terms of like, where's... What are the changes that we're going to be seeing in masculinity? You know, what, what's the world that your daughters are going to be living in? You know, I don't know. I really don't know. I would say, I'll tell I've never actually said this. This is good. I'm working through some stuff. But I, I'm kind of a little disillusioned uh, right now. I think it's not getting better. Nothing, I'll just speak for the U.S. Nothing here is getting better. And people ask me all the time, you know, how do you, we do like 3,000 posts a year. You know, we do 10 things a day, all highly original. We don't scrape anything. And that never tires me out. But trying to make sense of the world every day at 930 with my team of very brilliant people. I wish that we were four years into this project and I think we've been doing really interesting stuff and people seem really into it, but we don't have any answers either, you know, and, and some days it just feels like we're reliving the same bullshit. Yeah, I'm a little disillusioned, frankly, about what the next 10 years are. I think that men are still very, very, very split. I don't think either side is talking to each other very well. I think it's kind of ugly. I thought that the best thing about the Harvey Weinstein stuff was like, again, it was all out in the open and maybe we could move on. But I don't feel like we've moved on as constru- I think women have moved on more constructively, but I don't I still don't know if, if there's a constructive way forward yet or if anybody's like sort of found a path. So, yeah, I don't I don't feel incredibly positive about the next 10 years. I, I feel like the messiness might go on much longer than anybody would like or probably should. But maybe that's also just the human nature. It took us thousands of years to get here. So maybe it'll take a while to. To, un, to, to put it back together. It's a great question, and I wish I had an answer for you. I would have probably, I'd be doing a speaking tour and writing a book, and like, I'm gonna fix men, you know, this guy right here, is fixing men. I think once again, this proves that it's so, what an important role porn can have if we have access to diverse pornography, to actually challenge also this um, you know, the role of the man in sex. I think often it's portrayed that the man has to be totally in control of the situation, dominating. Even in the way it's shot, it will be like looking down on a woman, like giving him a blowjob and all of these things. And I don't think anyone's actually benefiting. If you want to have sex in that way and everyone wants that, fine. But it doesn't have to be like that always. It doesn't make you less of a man or less good at sex if you don't dominate like that. And I feel like I've had much worse sex as a result of men having those expectations in themselves, then they won't be able to get hard because they're like, oh, I've got to do all of these things. And they have such performance anxiety and they get hard as soon as we just like chill out and calm down about it. You know, like I think it it actually has a negative impact on performance overemphasizing it like that. You need to get exposed to more alternatives, more perversions, more sort of fantasies, more sort of like roles and situations. And it's not like an attack to masculinity. It's just like it's enriching everyone sex life it's like for the sake of everyone then you know? should we be educating young boys at like 12 about porn about how pallidia is right like i need to differentiate what porn is watching porn and what is real life and sometimes when i'm watching porn i'm like i don't like this because i think that it's that's what i think other people think that this is a reality and i don't enjoy that so do we have to start educating like young boys at 12 that porn is out there you probably have already seen it so let's just teach you what's real and what's a fantasy 
Yeah, it's education on the one hand, and it's also like very important to do it at a young age and so on. On the other hand, it's about like introducing like that diversity, you know, to make different kinds of pornography more available for everyone. Because many people think that the only porn that it says is like that this typical cliche porn because that's what they have on at hand, like the moment they like check on their phones or like open their laptops, you know. It's the most viewed, so it comes up all yeah. the time. And I think it does not only apply to porn, but to everything, really, because <laughs> I think it's it's interesting how much sex there is in you know mainstream media, like serious movies and so on, <laughs> without being explicitly showing the sex. But you always have like you know you have the flirty situation or whatever, or the approach, you know, the awkward conversations, the whatnot, and then the moment just before you know it, it blacks They're out. They're up against the bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> Moaning, intense moaning from Green Dress, Karen Eilis opening up. Exactly. I think actually that <laughs> spaces that are being created in, in mainstream media, but just showing a little bit, but not showing full nudity, not showing sex, but then just hinting at what's going to happen. It's creating my, many more fo- wrong expectations than actually porn showing yeah. a possible way of having and it's sex. Also, uh, and it, I think it's even like more narrow because it all begins like candlelight and so on. Inevitably, like the dude on top, mm-hmm. like 100% of the time like the lady like moaning like oh 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 he, right away mm-hmm. and then like five seconds later the dude is finished and like the woman is supposed to like have the orgasm already three seconds later they're both like lying in bed the ladies are always like having like their boobs covered and so the on sheets. and like the sheets and like if they wake up to have orange juice and make pancakes she's wearing the guy's shirt yeah. and she's like all happy and satisfied and radiant because somehow along the way in those three minutes she reached orgasm from missionary what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> exactly but that's what you see you see missionary positions you see like a very 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 limited way more limited yeah. version of sex than what you see in porn yeah I think that's super interesting about it being the shorter narrative tells so much, I mean obviously but tells so much less people do walk into sexual situations thinking they're just going to perform what's expected of them I think it's really sad that we're going into our bedrooms and we're just performing the social roles that we're playing outside of the bedroom dreams it's sad for everybody like the woman isn't getting satisfaction from just feeling like she has to lie there the man's not getting satisfied from feeling like he has to just know everything and like dominate and like just take all of those hints because the woman's not going to say anything because she's just supposed to lie there but I think, yeah and it also goes both ways right because i have to admit that i for a very long time i wasn't That's able to take the initiative i wasn't able i was maybe cut out in my imagination i could not envision myself taking the initiative yeah. and trying out different things i would maybe not just lie there but expect or respond to the cues that i was getting yeah, yeah. i'm totally with you on that <laughs> i feel like I don't have it in my mind to be like, should I do that? Oh, the moment's passed. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, but then we just, we have the option of having conversations about these things during those situations. It's not going to like dip to black. For our aftercare this time, we have the solution to all the problems of masculinity's crisis. I'm going to quote one of the articles from Mel magazines from the hashtag Ask Week that established three main points on how to open up and explore and enjoy your ass. <laughs> and those points are relaxation, communication, lubrication. What do you think, ladies? Do you think uh, working on more of men's asses is going to help everyone to be better persons and to have better sex and better relationships? Definitely. I think all assholes were created (laughs) equal-ish. Ish. (laughs) So it's not only women uh, enjoy anal sex. It's like, hey, dude, maybe you can like a finger up your little cute butt you know yeah i also think as much as we were saying earlier there are all kinds of sex it's not just penetration i think for men that haven't ever experienced penetration it's really interesting to suddenly be in that position yes there's a lot to be learned from it. I think that it helps them understand your experience as a woman a lot better as well. And it's a very vulnerable position to be in. But once you get through the challenge of that, it's going to open you up to so many things. Right. It's both. Yeah. Both just going through the position and giving yourself a chance to experience that. But also just the enjoyment. <laughs> that it brings. I mean, the, yeah. the pee spot, right? For us, the Tamazash. I haven't met a guy that has not loved it. I also don't think I've met a guy that hasn't been like, he was getting introduced to it for the first time. Like, I don't think it's that 
people aren't that aware. I mean, sure, gay men probably are a lot more aware. <laughs> but for straight guys, I don't think the peace spot is that much in the conversation. I guess that also in like some sort of a masculine world, the asshole is a taboo, like straight up taboo. And it can be like so much a straight up taboo as to cause men to have like poor hygiene. Uh, Got to the blue number two and not even able to wipe their asses correctly. That's like a proper yeah. debate, unfortunately. Far too much involvement. <laughs> For me, that is the issue. I'm like, yeah. have you had a shower? And when was the last shower? Then we can pick. <laughs> you, ask, you ask like that? I do ask. I'm like, when was the last shower? And how far away was the last shower? And when was the last poo? Okay, bend over. <laughs> well, it, it comes down also, if you want to do it, and also if you want to do it safely, globes, which are also like super, it's pleasurable and it's like hygienic on mm. both sides. Condoms, if you are like penetrating with an object and so on. And lots of and lots and lots of loop. Absolutely. Loop is our best friend here. Yes. <laughs> Actually, have you uh, tried the Uber loop? Yes. yes. I think it's <laughs> right now my favorite loop it's so far, favorite. especially for anal sex. Yeah, it's like silicone based. It's like the best for anal penetration. It's great for your hair. It's great for your hair. Really? You're putting it in your yeah, hair? Yeah, when I do it, gets too frizzy. It's happening a lot yeah. in Berlin. I like the glass bottle it comes in oh. as well, because you can just have it next to your bed and it looks nice. And then I think I've used it in so many more situations where I wouldn't have necessarily thought, oh, I'm going to use lube. Right, just because it looks pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a superficial yarn. That's great. Mm -hmm. I find like with the Uber lube, like it just, after I use like others lube, I feel like I have to have a shower because it, it dries on me like, like with a film. I don't yeah, know and you can like peel it off and like you can glue. Yeah, you know, but Uber Lube, it's like, oh, do I need to have a shower? Or can I smell, smell your like sex today? I want to smell like sex today. I'm Slip going. around on the bus seat. <laughs> um, I think that's another another thing about that, other than the like leaving a trace, it doesn't taste of anything, anything, which is yeah. really important for me. That's really put me off Lube in the past. Another thing that helped me a lot exploring my anus, <laughs> apart from lube, was anal plaques. Often we, you know, want to go straight for the full thing or whatever. And it's, you know, that's not how it works. At least that's not how my ass no, works. Not, <laughs> not, no ass works that way. Also like the myth of porn that you can just like stick like one massive stick into someone's asshole. Oh like that, that, but for that to happen, it required like lots of preparation. Mm. So you cannot aim just right away. Exactly. And I think especially when we're talking about, you know, when you're not used to have a conversation with your ass and then maybe you're hesitant and you don't want to leave let your girlfriend maybe put a finger in your ass because you're just not feeling it. Anal plaques can be another way of getting there without, you know, because it's it's a toy, not, not the finger of your girlfriend. So maybe that's, a, you know, the first step to getting it stretching and feeling. <laughs> be comfortable with your hygiene. Do it safely. Get your props ready. Do some nice massage. Enjoy yourself. Communicate. Your time, and communicate. Say what feels good or not. Yes. It doesn't make you any less of a man to like it up the butt. No, definitely not. I'm more of a man even. And it's so cool. I really like it. I really like pegging. I really yeah. like it. So like, I think I also like that path of like having like someone like to do it and having like this sort of trust somehow and like yeah. having like this sort of like traditionally masculine person like putting themselves in your hand or like showing that vulnerability, it gets... Oh, stop. <laughs> it's hot. It's not even like a moon. No, it's, it's yes, hot. It's End of story. Mm. Try it at home, kids. Right, all right. I'd say explore your asses, talk about your feelings, open up, be vulnerable, and be happy. On this positive note, a big shout out goes to Bad Bruces that is going for the very first time to happen in London. Bad Bruces is having an amazing party on the 18th of this month, so don't miss it. UK listeners, go on Party Wild, people from abroad, maybe consider buying a ticket and go celebrate Bad Bruces London, number one, Sodom and Gomorrah. Find the event on Facebook and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening. Please do let us know what you think it takes to be a man. You can follow us and write to us on Twitter and Instagram at Erstis Podcast and visit our website erstis podcastcom Leave us a comment there or a review as we read them all. If you don't want to miss any episode, please click subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, SouthCloud or wherever you listen to your podcast. 
The Earth Taste Podcast.